But secondly, these simple thoughts of good and bad are likewise immediately self-alienated. They're actual and are present in actual consciousness as objective moments. Thus, the first essence is state power, the other is wealth. As state power is a simple substance, so too is it the universal work, the absolute heart of the matter itself in which individuals find their essential nature expressed, and where their separate individuality is merely a consciousness of their universality. It is also the work and the simple result from which the sense that it results from their doing has vanished. It remains the absolute foundation and subsistence of all that they do. The simple, ethereal substance of their life is, in virtue of this determination of their unchangeable self-identity, mere being, and in addition, merely a being for another. It is thus directly the opposite of itself, wealth. Although this is indeed something passive, something devoid of inner worth, it is equally the perpetually produced result of the labor and activity of all, just as it is dissipated again in the enjoyment of all. It is true that in the enjoyment, the individuality develops an awareness of himself as a particular individual, but this enjoyment itself is the result of the general activity. Just as reciprocally, wealth produces universal labor and enjoyment for all. The actual has simply the spiritual significance of being immediately universal. Each individual is quite sure that he is acting in his own interest when seeking this enjoyment. For it is in this that he becomes conscious of his own independent existence and for that reason does not take it to be something spiritual. Yet, even when looked at from an external point of view, it is evident that each in his own enjoyment provides enjoyment for all, just as in working for himself he is at the same time working for all, and all are working for him. His being for himself is therefore in itself universal, and his self-interest is something merely in his mind, something that cannot get as far as making a reality of what it means to do, that is, to do something that would not benefit all. Here in paragraph 494, Hegel is now going to introduce two new terms for what we have been up till this time calling spiritual or ethical substance. Uh, we're going to have a polarity between state power, Staatsmacht, right? Sounds kind of nice, right? And uh, wealth, Reichtum, riches. Uh, so we have a, a duality occurring within the, the spiritual substance and individuality's relation to it. Um, just earlier, we saw Hegel talking about consciousness coming to terms with the, the good and the bad. And we're going to see him much later introducing, you know, the noble and the base, um, you know, the gut and the schlecht uh, here is going to become transmuted into state power and, and wealth. Um, not quite so directly in, in this paragraph. It almost looks as if at the beginning here, he's leaving that behind, he says, these simple thoughts of good and bad are likewise immediately self-alienated. That is, uh, what appeared to be so simple, what appeared to be uh, something that we could take as a criterion moving forward is, is not quite so, so straightforward and simple. Uh, it's going to present itself to us in, in a different way. We have good and bad when we're thinking in terms of pure consciousness. When we're looking at actual, wirklich consciousness, we have something else that is wirklich, something that we can look at, something that we can experience, something that we can orient ourselves in relation to. So he calls these objective moments. These are present in actual consciousness. Now that's an interesting thing to, to talk about. Does he mean that they're there as mere ideas present? in actual consciousness? No, uh, these are things that motivate us. These are things that we can, you might say, internalize. These are things that form the landscape of our moral environment and thereby become parts of or, or shapes within 
our own consciousness as individuals, as actual consciousness. It also is worth reflecting that this is a struggle that Hegel is going to see taking place not only in the ancient period and the medieval period, but, but going through into the modern period as well. So he says the first essence that we're talking about here is state power, right? Uh, the, the power of the state, the Staats mocked, right? And the second is wealth. As state power, he says, is the simple substance, so too is it the universal work. And here you see him talking about the heart of the matter, the zaka, right? The thing that earlier on we were calling uh, the project, the, the central thing that, that the consciousness in its action orients itself around and by and towards in which it finds its meaning. And state power can, in fact, provide us with that kind of locus of meaning. We've seen this taking place already earlier in the clash between the law of the community, the human law, and the law of the family, the divine law, right? The human law uh, had to take place through some sort of government. And uh, we could easily identify ourselves with that in part because it was manifest. And so Hegel here is going to talk about this as presenting us with a substantiality. He goes on and he says, this is the heart of the matter in which individuals find their essential nature expressed. And where their separate individuality is merely a consciousness of their universality. So in, in uh, aligning themselves with or under state power, the individuals thereby find a universality by which they can make sense of who they are and what it is that they're doing and what their purpose is. Um, even if they are themselves in a position where they are alienated, they're still also able to, in a certain way, identify with the, the state or at least the interests of the state. And this could be happening in, in a tyranny. This could be happening in a democracy. This could be happening in all sorts of regimes. The key thing here is that it is indeed the power of the state, the capacities, what it is that the state does. We see this even going on today with, you know, ways in which uh, human beings understand patriotism, uh, which is sort of an imaginary identification, affective uh, relationship to the state, but also in how they align themselves to the people who represent state power to them. Every, everybody from the police to the, to the mail carrier to the people at the Department of Motor Vehicles to, you know, uh, the IRS, uh, the Internal Revenue Service, for those of you who aren't here in the States, one of the most powerful branches of our government, right? Um, there's, there's all sorts of ways in which this can, can take place. So he goes on and he says, the individuals find their nature expressed in that. They, they find uh, that their, their separate individuality is merely a consciousness of their universality. Then he goes on and he says, it's also the work and the simple result from which the sense that it results from their doing has vanished. It remains the absolute foundation and subsistence of all that they do. The state transcends the individual. The state provides an overarching meaning to the life of the individual within it. You know, you might think here of examples within philosophy, like in Plato's Credo, where the laws uh, of Athens, which are about to kill Socrates, are represented by Socrates himself in argument with Credo, who has bought out the guards and has bribed them and is ready to take Socrates somewhere safe. Socrates himself says, no, 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 I, I exist within a social matrix. I exist in relation to the political authority, which is more than just the guy who happens to be in charge. The laws transcend us. The laws are greater than us. What do we have on the other side? Here's where Hegel talks about uh, wealth. He says, um, the simple ethereal substance of their life, the, the, of the life of the individual in relation to state power, 
is, in virtue of this determination of their unchangeable self-identity, mere being, in addition, merely being for another. So over on this side, we have being in itself. On this side, we have being for another. He says it's directly the opposite of itself, that is wealth. And this is an interesting way of depicting it. This is not usually how we think about wealth, although this is something that is a feature of it that has been discussed within classical philosophy. Typically, within the scope of the question of whether wealth is the true good, whether wealth brings us happiness or not. You see Cicero discussing this in the Stoic Paradoxes. You see Boethius discussing this in the Consolation of Philosophy. Very important point. Wealth is not what it appears to be. It is something more. And here we can see within Hegel, at least in this this section, a kind of prefiguration of the sort of economic analysis that somebody like a young Marx will carry out, and indeed the the later Marx, right? So he says... um, It's the opposite of itself, wealth. And he says, although this is indeed something passive, wealth is, something devoid of inner work, it is equally the perpetually produced result of the labor and activity of all, just as it is dissipated again in the enjoyment of all. So what we have in wealth is something dynamic by comparison to what we might call, the, if we want to be paradoxical, the static dynamicity of the state power. Wealth itself involves circulation. It involves production. It involves consumption. And all of this at the same time. It's not as if there's a single cycle where first it's produced and then it circulates and then it's consumed. No, there's always some wealth that is being created at the same time that other wealth is being consumed and it is circulating in between different people. And each, each individual is able to take part in this according to Hegel, finds a kind of meaning, should we say, or at least occupation within it. So he he says, uh, in the enjoyment, the individuality develops an awareness of of itself as a particular individual, but this enjoyment is the result of the general activity. So there's a kind of universality going on with this side as well. Uh, What does he mean here? I I understand who and what I am through enjoyment, through desire and satisfaction of desire, through buying things. You know, I I can find out that I like, you know, certain kinds of beer and I don't like other kinds of beer by trying them out, by drinking them, by consuming them. Uh, Maybe there's acquired taste, right? Maybe I start with, you know, Miller Genuine Draft and think that's really great stuff. And then I have some better things, you know, some, some nice IPA and some, maybe some Guinness. And then I'm like, well, MGD isn't quite so good, right? Or I I do this in comparison to other things. Maybe I do it, who knows, with, with chalk, you know, this chalk is really nice chalk compared to the other stuff. Oh, it writes on the board so smoothly. It doesn't make that squeaky sound. It isn't light in the hand and, and breaking up into pieces like the cheap stuff that you can buy. You know, you can go on and on and on with examples like this, you find out in part who you are through what you consume, but you also produce. You're also part of this circuit of production and circulation, according to Hegel, at least. So he says, um, we have a general activity going on here. And then he says, the actual has simply the spiritual significance of being immediately universal. So there's universality, again, on both sides. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. He brings up uh, each individual thinking that they're just acting in their own interest. They're being a particular uh, in, in participating in the economy that is creating, circulating, consuming wealth. But in doing so, and he's, he brought this up much earlier. Remember, back in the reason section, we we're talking about action. He says... Um, in the, in the, the enjoyment, he becomes conscious of his own independent existence and for that reason does not take it to be something spiritual. Yet, 
when looked at from an external point of view, it's evident that each in his own enjoyment provides enjoyment for all. Just as in working for himself, he is at the same time working for all and all are working for him. We are connected through this economic activity, activities, right? Not simply production, but consumption. Think about, for example, a, a restaurant. You go in, you sit down, you're shown to your table, the server comes, tells you about the specials. No, no, you just want to eat, order something off the menu. You order it, somebody in the back is producing it. They bring it out, you start consuming it. Hopefully not just, you know, shoveling it into your mouth, but consuming it first with your eyes. And then with, you know, your, your, your nose, your mouth, you eat fairly slowly, you enjoy the meal. The, the server comes by, can see that you're actually enjoying the food that's been prepared, goes back to the cook. Cook wants to know, or chef, or whoever, what did they think of it? Oh, they seem to be enjoying it. Enjoyment is not just one's own pure individual activity it involves others it could be antagonistic of course right you know uh you're the you're the jerk who, who people don't want to see coming in the door they spit in your food if you do enjoy it uh they're not enjoying the fact that you're enjoying it you know and 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 so on but um hegel's point here is that there is a kind of spread into something like universality in our enjoyment, in our production. Even when we think we're being just completely self-centered, we're serving some other purposes. In purchasing, I am keeping the economy going. Now, I'm also, of course, doing other things, you know, that he's not particularly concerned about here. Perhaps contributing to misery in some other place, ruining the environment. Um, you know, driving somebody out of business. If I buy everything from these, these huge conglomerates like, you know, Walmart or Amazon or, you know, whatever Google is selling or, or Microsoft or Apple, you know, you put those, those five together and you've got, you know, a significant portion of the U.S. economy, right? Uh, if I'm only purchasing from those, perhaps I am shortchanging somebody else. But that's not a question that Hegel is considering at this point. He wants our focus to be on the fact that in both of these, we have some sort of universal going on. So he says his being for himself is therefore in itself universal and self-interest is merely something in his mind, something he tells himself, something that cannot get as far as making a reality of what it means to do, to do something that would not benefit all. So we have the individual poised between these two, and now we need to look at this dynamic a little bit more closely. In these two spiritual powers, then, self-consciousness recognizes its substance, content, and purpose. In them, it beholds its dual nature. In one, it sees what it implicitly is. In the other, what it is, it is explicitly for itself. But it is at the same time, qua spirit, the negative unity of their subsistence and of the separation of individuality from the universal or of actuality and the self. Dominion and wealth, therefore, confront the individual as objects, that is, as things, from which he knows himself to be free and between which he believes he can choose or even choose neither. As this free and pure consciousness, he confronts the essence as something which is merely for him. He has then the essence, qua essence, within himself. In this pure consciousness, the moments of substance are for him not state power and wealth, but the thoughts of good and bad. But further, self-consciousness is the relation of its pure consciousness to its actual consciousness of what is in the form of thought to what exists objectively. It is essentially judgment. It is true that the immediate determinations of the two sides of objective reality have already made clear which is good and which is bad. The good is state power, the bad is wealth. But this first judgment cannot be regarded as a spiritual judgment, for in it one side has been determined only as a being in itself, or as the positive, the other only as a being for itself, and as the negative. 
But as spiritual essences, each is the interfusion of both moments and is therefore not exhausted in those determinations. And self-consciousness, which is self-related, is both in and for itself. It must therefore be related to each determination in a twofold manner, with the result that their nature, which consists in being self-alienated determinations, will be brought to light. In paragraph 495, Hegel is going to reintroduce these concepts of good and bad, uh, understood as the objects for pure self-consciousness, but now also the objects of the judgment made by self-consciousness of state power and wealth, respectively, as the good and the bad. And we're going to see this carry through uh, in the dialectic that's going to occur in the next you know, uh, number of paragraphs, where we begin with state power as the good, and eventually we're going to see that that it's not really such. And there's already some of this duality built in. If we jump to the very end, you know, uh, he says that each of these spiritual essences, you know, state power and wealth, each is the interfusion of both moments, therefore not exhausted in these determinations. Self-consciousness is really the nexus that is holding them together because self-consciousness, uh, which is self-related, is both in and for itself. And it's going to be related to both of these determinations determinations, good and bad, made of wealth and state power in a, as Hegel's going to say, twofold manner. This is what allows there to be a dialectical progression. But let's see where he first begins with this paragraph and then, and then how we get to that, that ending point for the paragraph, which is definitely not the ending point for what, what's going to be happening in the rest of this section. So he says that in these two spiritual powers, Self-consciousness recognizes, and here Hegel uses three terms, uh, one right after the other, very important, its substance, just the cognate substance, right? Content, inhalt, and purpose, zweck. So, so he doesn't say self-consciousness uh, finds these in only one state power or in, in wealth, he says it finds them in, it finds this, the, these uh, important aspects of itself in, in both of these two. And it has a choice to make between them. So he goes on and he says, uh, in them it beholds its dual nature. That is, the human being can be aligned with either of these, wealth or state power, economic activity, political activity, an economic way of looking at things, a political way of looking at things. He said, says, in one it sees what implicitly is, that is state power, what is in itself, anzik. In the other, it sees what is uh, for another, right? Uh, in the other, what is explicitly for itself. Then he says, but it, it is at the same time the negative unity of their subsistence and of the separation of individuality from the universal or the actuality and the self. So, What's really the bridge between these is the individual self-consciousness or more properly individual self-consciousnesses in the plural. That's what allows there to be any connection between state power, which lacking any individual consciousnesses wouldn't even exist, would it? With wealth, which again, lacking any individual uh, consciousnesses would not exist. Both of these the public, you could say, uh, the public and the private, however you want to put it, the in itself and the for itself, they can't exist without the self-conscious individual as their mediator. And the self-conscious mediator, in this case, becomes aware to a certain extent that they can make a choice. And the choice, Hegel says, very interestingly, is not just, well, either you got to choose state power or you got to choose wealth. You could choose neither. You could say, screw them both. I'm going to make my own way. I'm going to withdraw from society, man, and find myself an island and knit myself, you know, uh, stuff out of, I don't know, coconuts or whatever it is that people do, right? Bark from trees, all fish and do all that sort of stuff. That's a possibility. Dialectic's not going to advance with, with anything like that. But, you know, that, that opt-out is certainly an option, Right? So Hegel goes on and he says, um, 
as this pure and free consciousness, he confronts the essence as something which is merely for him. He has then the essence, qua essence, within himself. Self-consciousness becomes aware of the fact that it, it can choose between these and can choose for neither. Right? So here we become aware of a kind of central freedom. Now there's another movement to the bringing back in the good and the bad. Hegel says, in this pure consciousness, that is the consciousness of that freedom, the moments of substance are for him not state power and wealth anymore, but the thoughts of good and bad. Then he says, further, self-consciousness is the relation of its pure consciousness to his actual consciousness, the form of thought to what exists objectively. And Hegel says, this is essentially judgment. What is going on when we engage in judgment? We are connecting up the pure consciousness and the actual consciousness. We are connecting up the realm of thought and the realm of objectivity. Not usually the way we think of judgment, is it? But this is how Hegel is, is doing it here. And that judgment could be that something is bad or that something is good. And the judgments in this case, Hegel sort of takes it as kind of obvious that the state power is going to be cast as the good one, judged as the good one, and the wealth part is going to be judged as bad. Why? Because state power is, seems to be more universal. It's the whole society, whereas wealth is just you know individuals here and there uh, exchanging things with each other, self-interest, that sort of thing. I mean, in, in our society, I suppose we could say we have ideologies that see it the exact opposite, where state power is the big baddie, right? And wealth is, is the goodie economic exchange or something like that. So he says, it's true that immediate determinations of the two sides of objective reality have already made clear, which is good, which is bad. The good is state power. The bad is wealth. And he says, this first judgment, that is uh, that the, the state power is good, cannot be regarded as a spiritual judgment. For in it, one side has been determined only as a being in itself, as the positive, right? The other is being for itself and as the negative. So we have positive and negative in this, this first judgment. And this is a judgment that I think many people would make, and it is a judgment that historically did tend to get made. So I think Hegel's got a good basis for this. Now, where is Hegel going to go from this? Well, this is where we got to the, the end. He says, look, you know, you can't, it's not as simple as saying positive, negative, good and bad, because both of these end up uh, being an interfusion of both moments. You know, let, let's put it to you this way. I, I don't want to uh, give you too much of the story that's coming up. You don't get state power without the involvement of wealth. It's never so pure and simple as that, right? State power is always entwined with wealth. Likewise, you don't get a pure sort of circulation of productivity and consumption and all that without state power being involved in some way. And you don't get either of these without the individuals being involved in them as well. So the question going forward is, how are all of these going to be connected with each other? And what sort of conclusions should we draw? What are we learning in the process? And remember, too, that Hegel views this as a process of historical development of consciousness. Something is being learned on the way, not just for us, the phenomenologists who are studying this, who are watching it, but within history for human consciousness. 